In this video, we're going to take a tour through the smallest living unit, the cell. Before we get started, let's have a short history lesson on the cell theory. In 1665, Robert Hooke was looking at all sorts of different things under a microscope. While looking at a slice of cork, he was fascinated by the little compartments or rooms which reminded him of the small rooms in a monastery called cells. This is where we get the term cell from. However, Hooke was not seeing cells, just the spaces where cells had been. In 1677, Anton von Leeuwenhoek was making much better lenses and microscopes. He noticed never before seen microscopic living things made of single living units. In 1838, a German botanist, Matthias Schleiden, was investigating plants microscopically. No matter what type of plant and no matter what type of plant tissue he observed, he always saw the cellular structure. He concluded that all plants and plant tissue were composed of cells. The very next year, German zoologist Theodor Schwann, after observing many different types of animals and animal tissue, concluded the same thing about animals. In 1855, Theodor, I'm sorry, Rudolf Virchow confirmed observations of cells in different stages of cellular division and controversially published that cells must arise from pre-existing cells. It was controversial because he claimed work that was not his own. This body of work leads us to our modern cell theory with its three tenets. The cell is a small living unit, all living things are composed of cells and cell products, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. Now we need to look at cells in a very general sense. All cells have three regions, a cell membrane, a cytoplasm, which includes the inside, inside the membrane but outside the nucleus, and an area of genetic material concentration like a nucleus, for example. Now, cells can either be prokaryotic or eukaryotic. The question is, what's the difference? As we can see in this diagram, there's a definite increased complexity in the eukaryotic cells. They have a nucleus, which we lack here. They have large membrane-bound organelles that do not exist over here. Now, the one deceiving thing about this picture is the scale. In fact, many prokaryotic cells could fit inside of one eukaryotic cell. Filling out this chart, will help you review what you know about the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. In this video, we're going to focus on eukaryotic cells. However, I would like you to review this video on the origin of eukaryotic cells and the endosymbiont hypothesis. Click on the link found here. Now we're ready for our tour. We'll start in the nucleus. The nucleus is the central office of our cell factory. It directs the activity of the cell. The nucleus houses the genetic material, the DNA, which codes for the production of proteins. Basically, this is the instruction manual for our cell factory. The nucleus also houses the nucleolus. The nucleolus is for the production of ribosomes. You will notice that the nuclear membrane has many pores, which allows for things to pass in and out of the nucleus. Now let's move out into the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm includes the cytosol, which is mostly water with dissolved solutes and the organelles. Now we're going to go through each of the organelles and briefly describe them. Later in the year we might talk about many of these organelles in much greater detail as we discuss different processes that these organelles uh, help conduct. We'll start with the ribosomes. The ribosomes are the assembly line workers of the cell factory. They're the site of protein synthesis. Ribosomes can be free-floating where they make proteins for use in this cell or they can be attached where they make proteins to be shipped out of the cell. What are these robot ribosomes attached to? Well, the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see here that the endoplasmic reticulum is just an extension of the nuclear membrane, and the areas where there are ribosomes attached is referred to as rough ER, or rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the areas where there are no ribosomes attached is called smooth ER, or smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth ER is for the, is for the synthesis of lipids, the metabolism of carbohydrates, and the detox of drugs and poisons. The rough ER is for the processing and modifications of proteins to be shipped out of the cell and the formation of more membrane. These proteins that are produced must first be sorted and packed to be shipped out of the cell, and that's the job of the Golgi apparatus. For a very descriptive video on how the Golgi works, uh, click the link that I'm going to post right down here. But for now, our Golgi apparatus is for the sorting and shipping of proteins out of the cell, 
as the proteins get transported here via vesicle from the ER, uh, they move through the Golgi where they're pr further modified, uh, sorted, processed for shipment via a transport vesicle, in this case, out of the cell. And now we'll move on to the lysosome. The lysosomes are the digestive centers of the cell. The lysosomes produce uh, or contain hydrolytic enzymes, enzymes that help break down materials. In this case, you follow this one, it's going to dump those digestive materials into a food vacuole to digest food. But they also can break down and digest worn out organelles to recycle the parts. So it's our recycling digestive center. And vacuoles, vacuoles are for storage, a food vacuole. Uh, contractile vacuoles will store and eliminate water. And in plants, there's usually a large central water vacuole for water storage. Now we'll move on to the mitochondria. The first thing you should notice is that the mitochondria is a very large organelle with its double membrane. And the origin of this double membrane is uh, discussed in the video on the, the origin of the eukaryotic cells that I alluded to earlier uh, in the endosymbian hypothesis. But this is the site of cellular respiration where we break down sugars to release energy. In our analogy of the cell being a factory, this is our power plant where we burn fuel, creating energy to run the cellular activities. From there, we'll move on to plastids. Now, plastids are organelles found only in plant cells, and they're for carbohydrate production. Specifically, we have chloroplasts, which is our site of photosynthesis. Like the mitochondria, we have two membranes, and the origin of the chloroplast is also discussed in the origin of eukaryotes video uh, on endosymbiosis. Um, but it contains many of these photosynthetic uh, pigments, uh, chlorophyll, which gives it this bright green color. And again, it is our site of photosynthesis where we're going to make sugars. The other plastids are called leucoplasts. They're usually found, uh, or they can be found uh, in great numbers in the roots where we produce and store starch which is another carbohydrate. Then we move on to the cytoskeleton. And I don't think people really throw cytoskeleton in with organelles, but they provide a very important function for the cell. And this is a pretty amazing photograph where they use some uh, special technique to uh, highlight the cytoskeletal elements uh, using a specific wavelengths of light or a dye or something. Uh, but it's a fascinating picture to show how complex this system of protein microtubules and microfilaments uh, are dispersed throughout the cell. Over here, a little easier to see kind of how it might be working to give the cell some structure. Uh, provides a place for organelles to attach to, and when things move through a cell, it kind of provides a, kind of a pathway or a guide wires for them to follow. It's also involved in changes of cellular shape. So we can see the cytoskeleton has many roles. Now, that concludes our kind of tour through the inside of the cell, but there's another very important structure of the cell that we can't forget, and that's the outer membrane. Um, this membrane uh, is so important because it handles all the traffic materials in and out of the cell. It acts as our factory's gatekeeper. Anything that's going to come in or out of the cell is going to have to deal with this cell membrane. And we don't address it in this video because it deserves its own video. Um, but if you think about it uh, in terms of function, it's the gatekeeper. It allows some things in but not all things and some things out but not all things. And it provides a compartmentalization, gives us a distinct outside environment and inside environment across which certain metabolic processes can occur. Now, uh, if you click over here, there'll be a link for our very specific video uh, that covers just cell membranes and transport. It's important enough to get its own video. Before we move away from this, we also have to remember that it's on the surface where um, molecules are received through res certain receptors or cell-to-cell uh, -cell recognition occurs. So there's lots going on right here at the surface. I don't want to discount it. Uh, in fact, like I said, it gets its own video. And that brings us to our final discussion in this part, which is a uh, discussion on uh, cell size. So the question is, why aren't cells large? And it turns out that it has to do with a little bit of a math problem, the surface area to volume ratio problem. So if we think about the surface area, let me back out one more, um, the surface of the cell. The surface of the cell has to um, uh, handle all the the needs of the volume. So as the cell gets larger, its volume increases, so does its surface area, but its metabolic needs, its traffic in and out will increase across this cell membrane. So we have to stop here and do a little math about uh, surface area and volume. So if we have a cell that's spherical, like this cell, and we look at its surface area and volume, uh, the surface area, the, the formula for the surface area of a sphere, is 4 pi r squared. 
and the um, equation for volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now when the size is small, when it's a small cell, say the radius is 1, doesn't matter the unit, let's see uh, what happens to the surface area compared to the volume. We see that in this case the surface area 4 pi is larger than the volume uh, 1.33 pi. But as we grow the cell a little bit and make the radius 2, we see what happens that the surface area jumps to 16 pi and the volume grows to 10.67 pi. We can see that the rate of growth for this squared function is slower than for this cubic function. And when we grow a little bit more to the radius of 3, we see that we're up to 36 pi for the surface area and all of a sudden the volume has already caught up. And so we can see what's going to happen as we go to radius of 4, 64 pi to 85.33 pi, and as we jump to radius of 5, all of a sudden we see that the, the volume has grown so big that we're not sure if the surface area can keep up with the needs of this cell. And what happens is the cell has a difficult time maintaining homeostasis. So the question is, can cells be large? Well, it depends not if they're spherical, but what if a cell was shaped like this? It could have a lot of volume, uh, like a neuron, which is very long extensions of the axon because it's long and thin, has lots of surface area compared to its volume. Or if a cell is shaped like this, you could get a lot of volume and a lot of surface area. So the question, can cells be large? The answer is, it depends, and it depends upon shape. So. There it is, our tour through the cell. Make sure you review, uh, and I would suggest one more thing, review some diagrams of some generic cells, make sure you could label and give the functions of the different parts, and be able to do a comparison between a plant and an animal cell. Also, make sure you visit the links for the videos on the origin of the uh, eukaryotic cells, the video link I put up there for someone else's video on the function of the Golgi apparatus, and don't forget to review the cell membrane and transport video.